Thank you, Ben. Good morning, everybody. Let's go way back in the day for a minute, to 1975, when Saltzer and Schroeder released a paper called The Protection of Information in Computer Systems. Now, this was notable because it was the first time that anybody had ever written about this concept of least privilege. Today, of course, least privilege is all over the place. You can't study computers, and especially computer security, without hearing about it several multiple times. It's a pretty simple idea. You're going to give the permissions that somebody needs to get their job done, and none extra. The idea, of course, is that if an attacker compromises whatever you're giving permissions to, they're going to use those extra permissions to do bad things in your environment. And so in the paper, they gave the example of an airline attendant. So the airline attendant's job is to get you on the plane. To do that, they probably need the ability to view and modify your seat reservation. But they don't necessarily need the ability to view and modify the maintenance history of the aircraft. Today, we have a lot of clear-cut examples where this still works very well. If I'm working on a document with you, I'll probably give you edit access to that one document. But I'm not going to give you edit access to all of my documents. If we have an application and it needs database access, I'll probably give that application access to a couple of tables in the database. But I'm not going to make it a full database admin. So that's pretty simple. Everybody has least privilege, right? Target didn't. They were breached in 2013 when an HVAC vendor that they were using, uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, were themselves breached, and the attackers were able to get through the vendor into Target's network and install malware on point of sale systems. This resulted in 40 million credit cards being stolen and $250 million in counting worth of damage. Now you have to ask yourself, why did an HVAC vendor have so much access in Target's network that they were able to compromise point of sale systems? These are the exact kind of problems that we want least privileged to solve for us. Now, the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report comes out every year, great read for security, and it tells us that 18.4% of incidents involve privilege misuse. How about Equifax? I'm sure everybody heard about it. Awful breach in 2017. 143 million social security numbers. So this is not your run-of-the-mill breach. This is not your credit card getting stolen. You can change your credit card. It's not a big deal. I do it all the time. This is your social security number. You can't change it. These are the crown jewels of Equifax. You could argue that it was Equifax's single job to prevent these social security numbers from getting breached. And yet, here we are. Now, as you may know, Equifax was breached by a web application attack, an unpatched instance of Apache struts. The attackers used that as a foothold to get into the network and do further bad things. So Verizon tells us again that 29.5% of breaches involve a web application attack. Now, I would encourage us as an industry to not think about how do we prevent the web application from getting breached. Well, yes, we should absolutely do that too, but how do we prevent the web application breach from ending up with our crown jewels getting breached? And again, these are the kind of problems that least privilege should be helping us with. Okay, last one. Edward Snowden walked out of the NSA with a thumb drive with thousands of classified documents on it. Now, as you may know, Edward Snowden was an administrator. You have to trust somebody. You can't, if you can't trust administrators, then you can't function as a business. But again, I want to encourage us as an industry to think about how can we have permissions that you get when you need them, and then they go away when you don't need them anymore. And so if, you, if it's your job to administer a database, then maybe you get those permissions for the database when you need them, and then after you're done with the backup or whatever, it goes away. Verizon tells us that 25% of breaches involve some kind of internal actor. Now, it's important here to realize that these might not be the malicious insider. You might have very well-meaning people in your organization that get breached. You know, things happen but we want to limit those permissions, and this is the whole idea of least privilege. Okay, so I almost didn't want to bring up these examples. This is not about breach shaming. This, you know, there were people that cared deeply about the security of their organization working at all three of these places. 
You know, they, they care, they're smart, they're trying to do the right thing, and yet least privilege is very hard. Why is that? Well, first of all, we have these permissions that tend to be frozen in time. And so your application will be provisioned, it'll get permissions or whatever, however that works in your organization. And then if something changes, they don't really go away. Similarly, we over-provision in the first place. I'm sure everybody in this room has experience with somebody that was trying to make something work with a file, and they're just like, what permissions does it need? I don't know, we'll give it 777, figure it out later, you know? Full access to the file, we'll figure it out. But of course we don't. It's not on anybody's priority list, you know, first thing in the morning to go and fix that file permissions thing. The other reason we over-provision is because the meetings where you get permissions look like this. There are these big awful things where you have the security team on one side of the table, developers on the other side of the table, they're arguing back and forth. These meetings suck. I've been in both sides of the table and I know that nobody wants to be there. And so what's the incentive? Let's over provision a little bit, let's just give it what it's gonna need forever and then we don't have to come back and sit at this table anymore. So because permissions don't get smaller and we tend to over provision and if anything they grow with time, then you could say that the gravity, so to speak, pulls policies larger over time, which is the exact opposite of what we want. In the physical world, as I don't need permissions anymore, they get taken away. If I move out of my apartment, my landlord asks for the keys back. If I stop working at Netflix, they're gonna take away my badge access. And when I don't renew my passport, I lose the ability to leave the country eventually. But in software, we don't really notice these status changes or do anything about them. Think about how many abandoned projects are just sitting there in your environment with the exact same permissions that they had from day one. Except for now, they're not getting patched. The developers have moved on, they're doing something else, nobody's paying attention to these things. If you have a really small organization, you know, one or two software projects and one or two developers, you might be able to manually manage permissions the way that least privilege in the paper defines it. But for the rest of us, we need a different approach. We need something more scalable. At Netflix, we automatically remove permissions from our AWS account and policies. And this talk is about how we do it. But I think that the same approach could be used in other areas of security, and I'd love to see that. Okay, so let's chat basics. AWS imp implements a really nice role-based access control system called Identity and Access Management. In case you're not uh, familiar with role-based access control, it's pretty simple. Let's say I'm an application, Travis, and I have multiple roles, Travis the person and Travis the Netflix employee. And as a person, I have the permission to enter my car. And as a Netflix employee, I have the permission to enter the building. So our applications are the same exact way. They can assume multiple roles, and the roles give them permissions. Let's make this concrete with an example. Let's say we have a cloud-based word processor. Now in Amazon, we'd probably use the simple storage service, or S3 for this. And so we need the ability to read and write objects to S3. And then we're gonna give it a policy. So this is the way a policy might look. What do you think, pretty good? This is the sort of thing that would end you up in the newspaper, and not in a good way. If your policy looks like this, I suggest you get up right now, even though it's rude, just run back to your office and fix it now. This is basically full root on your cloud account, which is a lot worse than full root on a box. Attackers can spin up thousands of dollars worth of resources and launch attacks at other people on the internet, steal all your data, anything. So that's pretty bad. We know we don't want that. How about this? I think that emoji says it all. <laughs> this is full root on your S3, which is not quite as bad as full root on your cloud, but it's pretty bad. An attacker could delete all your data, delete all data from other applications running in your environment. We don't want this. Now we're getting somewhere. We have specific actions that we need, and the only problem is, is that we're not limiting it to a resource. And so if our word processor application gets compromised, then an attacker might be able to steal documents from the spreadsheet. This is our end goal. This is where we want to be, specific actions and the specific resources that we want those actions for. So to get there, we're gonna use lots of data that Amazon gives us about which services and actions and resources are used and when. 
Okay, another example. I work at Netflix, and I'm almost contractually obligated to watch tons of Netflix shows. <laughs> so I'm really excited about The Crown. I love this show. And let's say I get the brilliant idea to spin up a new application where we're going to take every face in the Netflix home row, and we're going to superimpose a crown on it with some machine learning artificial intelligence mumbo jumbo or something like that. So to do that, I need the ability to read an image and then use my mumbo jumbo on it and then write an image somewhere else. And maybe read from a queue to see when new objects show up. So the cool thing is at Netflix, we get these permissions by default. The developer doesn't have to do anything. They just get this base set of permissions that does most of what they need to do. Now, it's important to say that these are all benign permissions. If you need to do something a little weird or sketchy, then you're probably going to have to talk to the security team. But it's not going to be this big, awful thing that you saw in the previous slide. And for most people, they just get the permissions that they need out of the box. Then we're going to start using data and passively monitor the application for 90 days to see what it actually needs. And after that, we're going to start taking away things that are unused. So in this case, you know, I needed the S3 stuff and the, the Q stuff, but whatever the rest of this middle stuff is, I don't need it. So it goes away. And by go away, I mean we're going to actually automatically rewrite the policy to remove those permissions. Now, this is where the cool part comes in. Let's say a developer needs a new permission that didn't come in the, in the base set, or they want to add something back that got taken away. This is a very simple request in our environment. And by very simple, I mean like a minute. You send me a chat message, swing by my desk, something really easy. It's not going to be this arguing thing that we did before. And so whatever, I need something, it shows up. Easy. Think about how much time we could save with this approach. You know, we had, whatever, 10 people in a room for an hour. Nobody wanted to be there. That adds up over a lot of applications. And so we think that we're saving hundreds, if not thousands of hours doing this. And then when the application doesn't use permissions anymore, they go away. And so, you know, as excited as I'm about my, about my crown application today, let's say that I move on and do something else. Whole policy goes away. Automatically, within 90 days of the last time that I used it. And so the other cool part about this is that, remember those abandoned projects we had? Where people were excited about it and then they stopped patching it and moved on and did something else? Well, those things are totally powerless after 90 days. So Netflix, the first time that we did this, we removed 80% of the permissions from our environment. Since then, we've, we've removed a lot less, which doesn't sound impressive or good, right? But think about what it means. The only time we're removing permissions is when an application stops being used. And the reason we're not taking away a lot now is because we're already very close to the ideal permission set. OK, so this sounds good. It's not to imply that it's very uh, trivial to do. There are some things that you should consider when you're thinking about it. What about infrequently used permissions? The example I like to use here is your incident response team. You know, hopefully we're running a good security team and we're not having incidents all the time. But when we do have an incident, we really need that team to be able to get their job done. And so we'll just leave those ones alone. We'll exclude them from this process. Anything that's special like that, that's infrequently used, exclude it. What if we break applications? Well, for, I'll go a step further than that. It's not what if we break applications. I guarantee we're going to break applications doing this. But it doesn't have to be a big deal if you have the ability to, to detect that and put them back. So anytime we do anything with this, we store a previous version of the policy. And then we can literally press a button and put the policies back where they were. This is probably the biggest what if. What if an attacker compromises your system and uses permission that your application actually needs to do bad things in your environment? What do you think? Can't do anything about that. This is not a silver bullet. This isn't going to solve all of your problems in security. It's not about that. It's about a more scalable way of getting to this least privilege that we want to get to that's an ideal to limit the impact of a breach. OK. So what else might we apply this same methodology to? For starters, what about those mobile applications, you know, the, the crappy flashlight app that you download? And it basically asks for full admin on your account. Well, I've got bad news. 
Flashlight is probably malicious, and it's probably doing that on purpose to steal everything you have. But I think a lot of the times, the application developers just don't have a good handle on what the permissions are that their application needs. And so wouldn't it be cool if you had a sandbox environment? You can run your application in, see what it actually uses, and then have the sandbox generate a profile for you with the right permissions. I think that would be pretty cool. It would make it easier for developers. It would make it so that when I install the crappy flashlight app, I'm not giving full admin. Everybody wins. What about container capabilities? At Netflix, we have some pretty cool ideas, I think, in this space. Um, I don't have time to get into the details in this talk, but if this interests you, then please come chat afterwards, because I'd love to get into this a little more. OK, so closing thoughts. Least privilege, the way it was designed in 1975, makes a lot of sense. But it's not very scalable for the kind of systems that we work with and deploy these days. You know, if you had the one or two applications and you have the time to manually apply permissions, it'd probably be pretty good. What we want to do is make, reverse the gravity to make policies get smaller over time when you don't touch them. To do that, we're going to use a lot of data from our role-based access control system to see which permissions are actually used and when. And then we're going to use that data to dynamically rewrite the policy and, and repeatedly do this. It's not going to be point in time. We're going to do this all the time. And if we can adopt this approach, then we can scale least privilege to even the most large and complicated environments. By the way, I mentioned earlier in the talk that we do this at Netflix for our AWS policies. The tool that we use to do this is open source. It's called RepoKid. And I'd like to give a shout out to Patrick Kelly, who's not here today. He's in Colorado, and he just had a baby. But he is my co-conspirator on this project, and he was doing some version of this before I even got to Netflix. So a lot of, a lot of work for this is done by him. With that, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to my talk and open it up for any questions that you might have.